أعوذ بالله السميع العليم من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم <تصفيق> الحمد لله رب العالمين والعاقبة للمتقين ولا عدوان إلا على الظالمين وصل اللهم وبارك على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين سبحانك اللهم لا علم لنا إلا ما علمتنا إنك أنت العليم الحكيم رب اشرح لي صدري ويسل لي أمري وحل العقدة من لساني يفقه قولي أمسينا وأمس الملك لله والحمد لله لا شريك له لا إله إلا هو وإليه المصير أمسينا على فطرة الإسلام وكلمة الإخلاص وعلى دين نبينا محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم وعلى ملة أبينا إبراهيم حنيفا وما كان من المشركين اللهم إني أمسيت منك في نعمة وعافية وستر فأتم علي نعمتك وعافيتك وسترك في الدنيا والآخرة اللهم ما أمسى بي من نعمة أو بأحد من خلقك فمنك وحدك لا شريك لك فلك الحمد ولك الشكر يا رب لك الحمد كما ينبغي لجلال وجهك وعظيم سلطانك رضينا بالله ربا وبالإسلام دينا وبمحمد صلى الله عليه وسلم نبيا ورسولا ثم أما بعد My dear brothers and sisters السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته And welcome back to the Friday night uh, lecture And as I have mentioned earlier at Salat al-Jum'ah that uh, this lecture tonight is dedicated to uh, talking about the uh, the birth of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam and the historical uh, situation the historical circumstances of the birth of rasulullah alayhi salatu wasalam and we have said earlier today that uh, allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has blessed us with uh, brother farid can you close the doors please the doors the gates Brother Farid, he's not listening. Just somebody close the doors, please. Jazakumullah, it's noisy. We said that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, blessed us with Islam and blessed us by uh, uh, making us part of this ummah, the ummah of Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And in order to, to be thankful to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, and to, to uh, learn about uh, who is Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and to know how valuable is this blessing, this gift, then we need to, we need to learn about him. We need, we need to study the, the seerah of the Prophet alayhi salatu wa sallam. And tonight we will just talk about a very specific part of his uh, uh, time or usually the, the, the scholars of seerah, when they write the books of seerah and they talk about the life of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, they don't start directly from the time or the day uh, he was born. Usually they talk about what happened during that time. And tonight we will talk a little bit about the world before Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And the question we ask was this world, wa, 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 was this humanity? in need of a prophet at that time? What was going on? So if we look at the world at that time, we will see two superpowers. The Roman Empire from one side and the Persian Empire from the other side. These two superpowers fighting all the time against one another. Fighting, just seeking power. But in the same time, there was a group of people living in Arabia, Al-Arab. 
And the Arab society at that time was a tribal society, just tribes scattered everywhere in Arabia, in the desert, in the Sahara. And each tribe just, you know, uh, thinking about how to survive, how to be safe, how to find, you know, uh, uh, water and to find food. And this was their, their daily lives. And the Arab were far away from the noise that was going on in the north between the Roman and the Persian Empire. But in the same time, a portion of these Arab tribes, they were used by these two superpowers, al ghassasina wal Manadira. So one part of al Arab that were closer to Persia, they were used per, by the Persian army. And al Arab in a sham that were closed to the Roman Empire, they used to be used by the Romans. So al Arab were always in the front rows. Whenever there is a battle, there is a war between the Persians and the Romans, they used to use al Arab in the, you know, in the front rows. And this was a very sad reality at that time. It was a very sad reality. The rest of Al-Arab, they were in the desert of Arabia, having no clue, nothing about what was going on in the world. And the main uh, uh, place, or the most important place in Arabia was the city of Mecca. Why? Because of the sanctity of the place, because of Al-Kaaba. And Al-Arab, even though at that time they were polytheistic, mushrikeen, wathaniyin, they used to worship and awthan, the idols. But they knew that they can trace their, their, their lineage back to Prophet Ismail and Prophet Ibrahim alayhim as And somehow Al-Arab throughout you know, generations, they uh, uh, forgot the teachings of Al-Hanifiyya Samha. Al-Hanifiyya Samha was the deen of Ibrahim alayhi salam. They forgot. And they started worshipping the idols. Even though there were very few individuals among Al-Arab who refused to worship the idols. And they kept you know, themselves on the path of Prophet Ibrahim salam. Like Qus ibn Sa'id al-Iyadi, for example, and others. Like Waraq ibn Nawfal, the cousin of Khadija radiallahu anha. He was a Christian. Because he, you know, his logic was, who was the last prophet sent by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? It was Isa alayhi salam. Okay, I follow Isa alayhi salam, the last prophet. So, and they used to go to the marketplace and, you know, invite people to leave al-Awthan, to leave the idols and just go back to the path of Ibrahim alayhi salam. So this was the situation of Arabia. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has chosen his Prophet Muhammad وسلم, the last and final Prophet, to be among Al-Arab. For a reason. He didn't choose him to be among the Persians, or the Romans, or Ahlul Kitab, Banu Israel, as it used to be the case before him. He chose him to be, or to come from Al-Arab, from the heart of Arabia, from the city of Mecca. For a reason. Now, before the birth of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, uh, two major events happened in Mecca. And both events were kind of introduction. In Arabic, we say al-irhasat. Irhas means something that comes to introduce a major event. Something to introduce a major event that will take place. So these two main events, number one was the digging of the well of Zamzam. At certain time, the water of Zamzam disappeared. And Mecca, and the people of Mecca, they suffered. They didn't have enough sources of water. Until the time of Abdul Muttalib ibn Hashim. Abdul Muttalib was the grandfather of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. When he had only one son, the first son, Al-Harith, Ibn Abdul Muttalib. So the story started 
One night, Abdul Muttalib was sleeping at Al-Hijr, Hijr Ismail, next to Al-Kaaba. He was sleeping at night. And he saw somebody in the dream coming to him and asking him to do something. And he told him, احفر طيبة. Dig طيبة. طيبة من الطيب. Everything good, nice, that smells good. Actually, one of the names of al Madinah Munawwara is what? Tayba. Ihfar Tayba. And then he asked him in the dream, what is Tayba? And the person left. He didn't answer him. The following night, he was sleeping at the same time. And the same person came to him. And he asked him, Ihfar Birra. Birra from al Birr. Al Khair, goodness. Something that brings goodness. And he asked him, what is birra? And the person left. He didn't answer him. And in the third night, the same person came to him and he asked him by saying, Uhfur al-madnuna. Al-madnuna is something that is beloved to people, that is valuable. Uhfur al-madnuna. He said, what is al-madnuna? He left. And he did not answer his question. In the fourth night, the same person came to him and he asked him, Uhfur Zamzam. And he asked him, What is Zamzam? He answered, La tanzifu abadan wa la tuzam, which means something that will never disappear. La tanzif. It keeps coming out. Wa la tuzam. It should be always praised. It will be the source to provide water to all the hajij, al-hujjaj, those who come to Mecca for the, the, the obligation of al-hajj. Which means this person described precisely where Abdul, Mat Abdul Muttalib should start digging. عند, even عند قرية النمل, when, when you see the, the, the ants, this is where you should start digging. In the morning, Abdul Muttalib got his mi'wal axe, and he brought with him his son, Al-Harith, and he was the only son he had at that time, his oldest son. And he started digging. Next to Al-Kaaba. And Quraysh, the leaders of Quraysh, kept looking at him without understanding what, what, what is he doing. All of a sudden, he got his axe and he started digging. What is he doing? So they kept observing him from far away. And he kept digging and digging and digging until he saw some wet dirt, some kind of a clay, a sign of water. And then he made takbir, he said, Allahu Akbar. Yeah, al Arab, even before Islam, they used to say Allahu Akbar. He said, Allahu Akbar. And then all the people rushed to him. I mean, there is something going on here. When they saw the water, they told him, this is the well of our father Ismail. We have the right to this water. This is not yours only, Abdul Muttalib. This is ours too. And Abdul Muttalib refused. He said, no, this is mine. I saw the dream. This message came to me that I should dig here. This water is mine and no one has right except me. Then they started, you know, arguing with him and he was fighting back against what they were saying. Until he told them, okay, I'm ready for arbitration. Choose anyone you want to do arbitration. To show you that this is my water. Then they suggested this, this woman called Kahinatu Bani Sa'd. Kahinat Bani Sa'd. Kahina means fortune teller, future teller. You know, these kind of people who try to, you know, pretend that they, they, they know what's going on in the future and all that stuff. And this lady used to live in a, in a very far away place, uh, almost in a sham. So they decided to go to her.
to have her as, you know, uh, to do arbitration. On their way, Abdul Muttalib got his camel and he left. And from each tribe from Quraysh, there was a small group having their camels and heading towards that lady. At that time, there was nothing, just a wild desert, no water, nothing. In the middle of the way, they run out of water. Many of them, they run all out of water. And very few of them, they had some water. So they got thirsty. And they almost started dying out of thirst. And those who didn't have water asked those who have water, can we have some water from you? He said, no, we can't. Look at the place we are in. If we, give, if we give you some of our water, we might get all thirsty, so we don't want to share our water. So Abdul Muttalib told them, listen, guys, we're going to die out of thirst, all of us. But instead of dying, all of us, without being buried, and, and, and you know the, the wild animals will come and get whatever they want from our bodies, why don't we start digging our graves? Everyone, start digging your own grave. So whenever one of us dies, we'll just you know, use whatever power energy we have to push him inside the grave and just pour some dirt on him. So this way, all of us will be buried except the last one. So having one body, you know, offered to the wild animals is better than having all our bodies. They said, okay, this is a great idea. They started digging. And while digging, Abdul Muttalib had an, another, another suggestion. I mean, he was a leader, you know, people used to respect him. He told them, while we are digging, why don't we do something, take action? Let's just go, walk, whatever. Maybe we will find water, you know, on our way. They said, okay. They stopped digging, and they started getting their camels. You know the camel, when the camel sits on the ground? They started getting their camels up, ready to just continue their way. When? Allahu Akbar. The last person to get his camel from the ground was Abdul Muttalib. When, he, when his camel got up, the water started gushing from that place, from the ground. The water started gushing, coming out. And Abdul Muttalib was so happy. He got that water, he drank, he invited everyone, come get water. And they filled up their, you know, whatever containers they had, and they were happy. And then they looked at him and they told him, listen, Abdul Muttalib, the one who granted you the water here is the same one who granted you the water of Zamzam in Mecca. And this is a sign that you have been chosen amongst all of us to be blessed with this water. So we're not going to this kahina, to this lady anymore. Let's go back to Mecca. Abdul Muttalib, the water is yours. Nobody is going to compete with you. Nobody is going to claim that he has any right in that wa The water is yours. That's it. Let's go back to Mecca. This is a clear sign. So they went back to Mecca. And the, the one in charge of the water of Zamzam was Abdul Muttalib. When I say he was in charge, it doesn't mean that the well of Zamzam was his and he, he started selling water to people. No. It was just a symbolic leadership, ownership. Because the water of Zamzam became the own, you know, uh, he, it was owned by all the people. Anyone coming anytime, they used to get the water. And he was looking for that honor and that privilege to do it himself to you know, offer the water to Al-Hajjij when people come to Mecca for Hajj. He was the one giving them the water. That's it. He was looking for that status that Abdul Muttalib is the one in charge of the water of Zamzam in Mecca. 
And the water of Zamzam, my dear brothers and sisters, is mu'jiza, is a miracle. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala granted that water to our mother, Hajar alayhi salam. And we know the, the story. When Ibrahim alayhi salam took Hajar and the baby Ismail to Mecca, and he left them by themselves, and then later on, Hajar ran out of water, and the baby Ismail started crying, and then she was looking, you know, between the Safa and the Marwa, and finally, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala provided her with that water. Some scholars, they said, you know, it was Jibreel striking the ground with his wing, something like this, then the water started coming up. And since the time of Abdul Muttalib, the water of Zamzam is start coming out until now, non-stop, alhamdulillah. And one of the most beautiful things that we do whenever we go to Mecca is what? Is drinking the water of Zamzam. Drinking the water of Zamzam. The Prophet وسلم, said in the hadith, Inna ta'am tu'min. Ta'am, it's food. The water of Zamzam is not just water that we drink when we are thirsty. No. Even when we, when, when we are hungry and you want to fill up your stomach with food, instead of eating, just go and drink from the water of Zamzam. In another hadith, the Prophet وسلم, said, Ma uzamzam lima shuriba lah, which means uh, uh, it, it, it's up to your intention when you want to drink from the water of Zamzam. Make, make a wish, make a, a dua, you know, have something. Say something to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Ya Allah, you know, make this uh, uh, water of Zamzam uh, a reason to cure uh, my sickness to whatever dua you make. So Zamzam lima shuriba lah. Zamzam will, Allah will benefit you through the water of Zamzam according to your own intention to your own dua and one of the best gifts when we come back from hajj and umrah uh, that we bring to our families and our loved ones of course is what the water of zamzam alhamdulillah so this is a, a major event that took place uh, uh, you know before the birth of the prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam because al haram in mecca mecca itself as the house of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, uh, Zamzam has been always a very important part of the rituals that we do over there. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wanted to honor his Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, who was not born at that time, but he prepared Mecca for him. To, so when he comes, Mecca will have the high status amongst all Al-Arab. The second incident or event that took place was Ashabul Fil. And this event took place about 50 days before the birth of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Many scholars, they said that the Prophet sallallahu was born after 50 days from what happened to uh, the army of Abraha. Abraha was the leader of Yemen at that time. And Yemen was part of the Abyssinian Empire, Abyssinia al-Habasha. And Yemen was part of it. And it was land of Christians. The dominant religion in, in uh, Abyssinia and, and Yemen as part of it was uh, Christianity. Abraha, as a leader, when he saw al kaaba and Mecca al-Mukarramah, uh, serving at that time as kind of like the World Trade Center, you know, it's a place of ibadah, but also it's a place of commerce, of business. And people were attracted to Mecca, especially during the time of Al-Hajj. And people go to Hajj because there is Al-Kaaba. So Abraham thought about building something that looks like Al-Kaaba, something that will attract people in Yemen. So he built, uh, you know, a beautiful place and he started, you know, uh, inviting people from all over Arabia to come and do business over there, and at the same time visiting that place. Nothing happened. Nobody cared about him. So Abraha was really mad. So his jealousy started, you know, motivating him to take action. What is the action? He decided to go and destroy, demolish al Kaaba, out of jealousy. How come? 
I built this here, I was expecting them to come and, you know, do business here, but nobody came. So what I should do, I will go and destroy that place, Al Kaaba. So he decided to move towards the north, Al Kaaba, or Mecca Al Mukarramah, with a huge army. And he had the elephants, not camels and horses like Al Arab, but he had elephants. That's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala called them Ashabul Fil. Al Fil means the elephant. On his way, some of the Arab tribes in the northern Yemen, nowadays Najran, like the southern part of Saudi Arabia, they heard about his move to destroy Al Kaaba. And they didn't like that. They felt that they have to do something to stop him. So the first group of tribes, they went out. They tried to stop him, he fought against them, and he captured their leader. He was about to execute him, and then he told him, you know, I mean, you, you can execute me, but you are, go you are not going to get anything out of that. So just keep me alive so I can, I can help you. So, and then there was, and he started moving north, and there was another group of tribes. They came out, they started. They tried to stop him, he fought against them, he, captures, and he captured and arrested their leader. And he took all of them with him on his way to Mecca. When they arrived to At-Ta'if, At-Ta'if is about 50 kilometers in the southeast of Mecca. When he arrived to At-Ta'if, the leaders of At-Ta'if, they went out to him and they told him, listen, Abraham, we are good people. We're not going to stop you. Do whatever you want. Just leave us alone. Not only this, but they gave him, they offered him a man by the name of Abu Rughal. Abu Rughal. And they told him, this guy will help you, showing you the way straight to Al Kaaba. Always there are those who, you know, sell their, 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 whatever, conscience to the enemy. So Abu Rughal showed him the way until a place called, um, I forgot the place, called al Mughammas, very close to Mecca. This is where Abu Rughal died. And his grave became a place that everyone after that, whenever people pass by his grave, they stone him. They stone him because he became a symbol of treason. He betrayed his own people, Al-Arab. Until now, every time people pass by his grave, they just stone his grave. He became a disgraced person. So when Abraha, became closer to Mecca. He settled over there. And he started using the people, Al-Arab, that he captured to go and find out you know, the surrounding of Mecca. He sent someone, and he found the, the, the camels of Abdul Muttalib, about 200 camels uh, outside Mecca. He confiscated all of them. He took them back to Abraha. And then he sent someone who knows Abdul Muttalib to Mecca. And he talked to Abdul Muttalib and he told him, Abraha is here and he's telling you that I didn't come to fight against anyone. I'm not interested in fighting anyone. I'm here to destroy Al Kaaba and go back. That's it. This is my mission, to destroy Al Kaaba and go back. So Abdul Muttalib told him, you know, he is superpower, more powerful than us, and we don't have the ability to fight against him. If this is what he wants to do, here is Al Kaaba. But can you talk to him, since you know him, <laughs> to, give me back my, to give me back my camels? I want my camels back. I told him, okay, I will tell him this. If you want to come with me, I will introduce you to him. He said, okay. 
So Abdul Muttalib went with the man, and that man went to Abraha, and he told him, I brought you the, 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 the man of Mecca, the most respected man of Mecca. He wants to talk to you. And Abraha, when he saw Abdul Muttalib, and Abdul Muttalib was a strong man, you know, tall and handsome man. When he saw him, he showed respect to him. He was sitting on his couch. When he saw him, he sat on the ground and he asked him to sit next to him on the ground, out of respect. So he told him, okay, we are here just to destroy Al Kaaba and we go back. Then he told him, you know what? I'm not here about Al Kaaba. I'm here about my 200 camels. I want them back. Then Abraha looked at him and he said, you know what? When I saw you the first time, I really respected you. But since you don't care about Al Kaaba and you care about your camels, there is no respect to you. How come you are not telling me anything about Al Kaaba and you are only telling me about your camels? At that point, Abdul Muttalib said his famous you know, saying that, Lil Kaabati Rabbun Yahmiha. I am the Lord of the camels. I want my camels back. If you want to Al Kaaba, if you want to go and destroy Al Kaaba, Al Kaaba has a Lord, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If He allows you to destroy it, nobody is going to stop you. So, would you please give me back my camels back? And He asked for His camels to be given back to Abd al Muttalib. And Abd al Muttalib, He took back His camels and He went back to Mecca telling the people of Mecca, all of you, okay, tomorrow, get out of your homes, go to the mountains, far away, and just let's watch what's going, what's going to happen. No one should stay in Mecca. Just get out of your homes, go to the mountains, and let's see what happens. The following day, Abraha decided to move. And when they tried to move the, cam the, 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 the elephants towards Mecca, the elephants didn't want to move. They got stuck right there. They tried everything to push them, to hit them. They did everything possible. The elephants didn't want to move one step towards Mecca. When they directed them towards the south, to Yemen, the elephants started running. They brought them back towards Mecca, they stopped. At that point, a huge, you know, number of birds coming from the west, from the, the area of Jeddah, coming from the west. Those birds that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala called what? Tayran Ababil. Tarmihim bi hijaratim min sijil. Each bird was carrying three stones, small stones. The scholars, they say like, like uh, al hummus, like the peas, the chickpeas, you know. Min uh, sijil, sijil, fire, anar, like fire stones. Tarmihim bi hijaratin min fajalahum ka asfim ma'kul. Al asf is the grass, ma'kul eaten. It's like the eaten grass, you know. So the birds started throwing these fire stones on them. And every time a stone hit a man, a person, this person is killed on the spot, on the spot. Abraha and few members of his army were not killed there. They could escape. But subhanAllah, they said that every time going back to Yemen down south, Every time they move, part of their bodies started falling down, like their fingers, their nose, their ears, their hand. When the time they arrived to Yemen, they were like almost skeletons, just a heikal azmi, skeleton. And they died shortly when they arrived to Al Yemen. And by doing this, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala saved Mecca. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala saved the Kaaba and saved the people of Mecca at that time. 
So after this event, Mecca became, of course, al Arab started spreading, you know, all the news about what happened. And Mecca became even more sacred, more respectful. And Quraysh, the status of Quraysh went very high. That al Arab, they, were, they started saying that Allah is the one who protected Mecca and protected the people of Mecca. So this is how Quraysh got a very high status within al Arab. And Mecca became more sacred. People started observing, you know, a lot of respect to Mecca and to the people of Quraysh because of what happened. But think about it. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did all of this for one reason. Because the Prophet sallallahu was coming. And Mecca was supposed to be the birth of the Prophet sallallahu birthplace. And the place where the Prophet sallallahu will be raised. Will start his da'wah will become a prophet. If Abraha was able to destroy the Kaaba and destroy Mecca, and the, you know, what will happen after that? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also wanted the Prophet sallallahu to come from a people who have a very high status amongst all Al-Arab. And coming from even a family that was considered one of, if not the, most noble family in Mecca. He was the descendant of Abdul Muttalib, Ibn Hashim, Ibn Abdi Manaf. And this family of the Prophet ﷺ was a very noble family. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala prepared Mecca for Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The scholars said that this is, you know, especially this, this uh, um, event was a very important event, preparing and introducing the coming of the Prophet ﷺ. And it became, you know, that specific year was called Amul Fil, the year of the elephant. And the Arab, they started, you know, uh, 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 considering that, that year as a reference. They say one year before Amul Fil, or two years before Amul Fil, or it happened in Am al-Fil, or one year or two years after Am al-Fil. That's why we say that the Prophet ﷺ was born what? In Am al-Fil, in the year of the elephant. And most of the scholars, they said that he was born 50 days after this event of the elephant. Most of the scholars, they said that the Prophet ﷺ was born in that year. All of the scholars, there is ijma' consensus that the Prophet ﷺ was born on Monday. And many of them said it was Monday, the night of the 12th of Rabi'ul Awwal. There is no ijma' consensus, but most of the scholars, they said he was born in the night of the 12th of Rabi'ul Awwal. Um, and it was a Monday. Why there is ijma' about Monday? Because there is hadith about it. When the Prophet ﷺ was asked, why do you fast Mondays and Thursdays? He said, Monday because I was born on that day. And Thursday because my actions, my deeds, a'mali, will be displayed to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on Monday, on Thursday. And I would like to be fasting when, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will look at my a'mal, at my deeds and actions. So he was born in the home of Abdul of Abi Talib. He was born in the home of Abu Talib. And when the Prophet ﷺ was born, his father was dead. His father died, Abdullah ibn Abdul Muttalib, died when Amina was pregnant with Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He was born, uh, Abdullah died on a trip, uh, coming back from Sham. You know, he was doing business on his way back from Sham. He died when he was visiting uh, his uncles, Banu Najjar, and he was buried over there. Some scholars, they said, it's as if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was telling Abdullah ibn Abdul Muttalib that your mission in this life is over. 
And let this child be raised by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Let this child be taken care of by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This child doesn't need a father at this moment. He will be born as an orphan without a father. He was, he, he was born uh, uh, in, the, in the house of Abu Talib, which was, you know, the, the, the uncle of the Prophet uh, the, 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 the brother of, of Abdullah. And um, the Prophet وسلم, said something about his birth. He said, Ana da'watu Abi Ibrahim. I am the dua that was made by my father Ibrahim. And the dua, you know, in the Quran, Rabbana wab'ath fihim rasoolan minhum. So Ibrahim alayhi salam asked Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to send to Al-Arab, to the, to, the, to the offspring of Ismail, a messenger from amongst themselves. Not somebody coming from far away, no, from amongst themselves. And he said, Wabushra Isa. I am the good news, the glad tidings that was given by Isa alayhi salam. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told us about that. وَإِذْ قَالَ عِيسَى بْنُ مَرْيَمَ لِلْحَوَارِ وَإِذْ قَالَ عِيسَى بْنُ مَرْيَمَ يَا بَنِي إِسْرَائِيلِ إِنِّي رَسُولُ اللَّهِ إِلَيْكُمْ مُصَدِّقًا لِمَا بَيْنَ يَدَيَّ مِنَ التَّوْرَاةِ And then وَمُبَشِّرًا بِرَسُولٍ يَأْتِي مِنْ بَعْدِ يَسْمُهُ أَحْمَدْ مُبَشِّرْ I'm here to, go, to give you the good news البشرة, the good news that there will be a, a Rasul, a messenger coming after me by the name of Ahmed, which is Muhammad. So he said, Ana da'watu Ibrahim. I am the dua of Abi Ibrahim, my father Ibrahim. Wa bushra Isa. And the good news given by Isa alayhi salam. Wa ra'at ummi annahu yakhruju minha nurun adha'at minhu qusuru sham. That at the time of the birth, my mother Amina bintu Wahab, she saw that a light was coming out of her. A light was coming out of her to enlighten all the palaces of a sham. A sham, which includes Jordan, Syria, Palestine, and Lebanon, the entire place called the sham. The scholar said, why a sham and not Al-Iraq and not Yemen and not Egypt and not Mecca, Medina, a sham? They said, because a sham is a blessed place and a sham is where Al-Islam will remain till the end of the time. Till the end of the time. And we know according to many hadith of the Prophet ﷺ that Isa alayhi salam will come back in a sham. Will come back in a sham. So it's a blessed place and the Prophet ﷺ by this hadith indicated that this is where Al-Islam will remain uh, till the end of uh, the time. So the Prophet ﷺ was born and the very first lady, actually she was a young girl, who babysit him was Ummu Ayman, Baraka. Her name was Baraka, nickname Ummu Ayman al Habashiyah. And Ummu Ayman <coughs> was a maid of his father, uh, uh, Abdullah. So she was living with them uh, uh, at home. And this Ummu Ayman, subhanAllah, I mean, she is a miracle in herself. Ummu Ayman was there when the Prophet ﷺ was born. She was next to, to, to uh, Amina. And she was there next to Aisha when the Prophet ﷺ died. And she died after the Prophet ﷺ by 50 days. After the Prophet ﷺ, she died by 50 days. Ummu Ayman is the lady that uh, the Prophet ﷺ asked uh, uh, Usama ibn Zayd, uh, Zayd ibn Haritha, to marry her. She became the wife of Zayd ibn Haritha. And she gave birth to Usama ibn Zayd, one of the greatest among the Sahaba, radiyallahu anhu. He was a young man when the Prophet sallam, appointed him as the leader of the Muslim army, right before his death, alayhi salatu wassalam. Umm Ayman is, is, is a great woman that I really urge you and encouraged you to go and read about her. She was born, she was the first girl to take care of the Prophet ﷺ, to babysit the Prophet ﷺ, and she was there when he passed away. She accompanied him in his entire life. And the Prophet ﷺ, when he, when he grew up, actually he freed her. 
you know, uh, she, was, she was a slave of, Ab uh, of Abdullah, uh, his father. And when the Prophet ﷺ grew up, he freed her, he gave her freedom, and she married uh, Zayd ibn Haritha. So she was the first one to take care of him. And the first one who breastfed him was Thuwaybah. And Thuwaybah was the slave of his uncle Abu Lahab. Abu Lahab was very happy because of the birth of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And because of that, he freed Thuwaybah. He gave her freedom out of happiness that the Prophet Sallallahu was born. So this is how uh, the Prophet uh, was born. And then at the very young age as babies, as infants, I would say, as infants, the people of Quraysh, the people of Mecca, Mecca was, was, was a city, was a town. And the people, the families of Mecca used to uh, always prefer sending their, their, their kids to, to be raised, to grow up in, in the Bedouin, outside the city. You know, they used to consider a city as, as a place that is corrupted, that is not the right place for the kids to, to grow up, to be raised. So they used to send them to the Bedouin. Halima Sa'diya, min Bani Sa'd, Halima, was one of a group of women from the tribe of Banu Sa'd who decided to go to Mecca. And they heard that, you know, several families in Mecca, they had some babies. So let's go and get, because it was a source of income. Families used to give them their, their, their infants and they used to pay money. They used to pay them. Halima Sa'diya with her husband, they had a, a very old, you know, tired, sick donkey that kept them, the, the, you know, in the back, the, the, the last in that, in that group. All the other ladies, they rushed to Mecca and they arrived before her and they knew where are the wealthy families. They knocked on the doors, they, get, they got the, 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 the infants and they got a lot of money with them. And Halima arrived, arrived to the city of Mecca very late. And when she checked, all the babies who belong to the, to the wealthy families are gone, are taken. And there was only one baby, one infant, one child called Muhammad He is the son of Abdullah and Amina. He is an orphan. And his mother was, <laughs> didn't have any income. So Halima said to her husband, you know what? It's better than, you know, to, 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 get this, to get this child, it's better than going back with empty hands. She went to her mother, to his mother, and she talked to her. She gave her very little money. This is all what she, she could afford. And they grabbed the baby Muhammad, sallallahu alayhi wasallam, the child, and they were heading back. And subhanAllah, from the first step, they realized that this is not a normal child. This child is, is amazing. You know, that donkey that was sick and tired and, you know, old, became like a horse. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave him energy. And they went back. And they arrived to their tribe before everyone else. And then, you know, uh, because we don't have a lot of time, al baraka started coming down to the house to the family of Halima Sa'diyah. She started seeing a lot of changes, a lot of things. You know, those goats and sheep that she had that were, were all dry, no milk coming out of them. SubhanAllah, the milk started coming and everybody, you know, in the family was happy. And this was because of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. She, you know, she kept him for some time and it was time to go back to Mecca to give back those kids to their families. So she went back with the intention of renewing the contract <laughs> with Amina. And she told her, I don't know any money. I don't want any money from you. You know, just please let me take him back. Because once we got him, we have seen miracles at home. And her mom and his mom, Amina, told her, this is an amazing child. This is not like anyone else. So she took him back. 
And when she took him back, he was, you know, a child running and going out as a shepherd with, 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 this, with the kids of, of Halima herself. And hap it happened to him what is known in the seerah by Haditha to Shaq al-Sadr, the opening of the chest of the Prophet ﷺ. When two men came to him and they put him on the ground, they opened his chest, they got something, they washed it, they put it back, closed him, and then they left. His brothers in Rada'ah, you know, the, the, the children of Halima Sa'diya, observed what happened. They went straight and they told her. And Halima went back with them to check Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and he was, he was okay. But Halima got scared. She thought that this is a sign of the beginning of problems. So she decided to take him back to her, his mother, Amina, bin Tuwah. And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam stayed with his mother until he became six years old. At six years old, his mother passed away. And his grandfather, Abdul Muttalib, took care, of, took care of him for two years. And he passed away when the Prophet ﷺ was eight years old. And then Abdul Muttalib, before he passed away, he asked Abu Talib, he told him, you are the one who should take care of Muhammad. Don't let anyone else from the family. You should take care of him. Even though Abu Talib had a lot of kids, and Abu Talib was a poor man. You know, he was not able, you know, financially to take care of. So this is why the Prophet Sallallahu when he became uh, like 10 or 11 years old, he started working as, as a shepherd just to, to help his uncle with uh, some finances to, to provide for the family. So my dear brothers and sisters, this is the beautiful story of the birth of the Prophet Sallallahu We talked about what happened before his birth, we talked about his birth, we talked about what happened after that. This is something that we should always read about and remind ourselves and remind, tell this story to our family members, to our kids, to our community members. This is how we help each other to always keep that remembrance of the Prophet Sallallahu that love for the Prophet ﷺ. And this is just a very limited portion of his life. When we go and we talk about his childhood, his uh, young age, and uh, you know when he started working as a shepherd, when he started doing commerce and business, and his marriage to Khadija radiallahu, in every part of his life, there are so many beautiful things that we can learn. So may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us always to remember our Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us to learn from his life, from his seerah, and then seek the path of righteousness that the Prophet Sallallahu showed us. Always we ask Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala to make us among the sincere and the truthful and the trustworthy followers of Muhammad Ali Salatu Wasalam. So on the day of judgment, inshaAllah, we will be included when he will be asking Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala, Ummati, Ummati, we will be part of his Ummah that will be saved and will be granted al Jannah, insha'Allah. Ameen, ameen. Jazakumullah khayran, barakallahu feekum, hafidhakumullah, wassalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. And next week, insha'Allah, we will go back to our uh, tafsir uh, lessons and we will go back to Surat Al-Hujurat bi-ibnillah. Jazakumullah khayran, assalamu alaykum.